Sometimes we find ourselves with very limited equipment. For instance, I'm sat now in my car with nothing more than my phone and this awful laptop to try and convey to you just how bad it is. This right here is a HP Pavilion 15, and has actually featured on the channel a good few years ago. Since then, it has actually seen some use, and condition-wise, would you believe that I've actually gone through, stripped it all apart, cleaned it all, and it still looks this rough. Featuring the rather fascinating AMD A10 4655M APU, which is certainly a mouthful to say, it has an integrated HD 7620G graphics chip, but more interestingly also incorporates a dedicated Radeon 8670M. We've got 8GB of RAM, which is DDR3 clocked at some speed I'm sure, and I've replaced the tired 1TB hard drive with a spare 240GB SSD. As when I got this laptop back, well, the hard drive was in such a state that it would promptly spend 15 minutes booting into a bloated copy of Windows 10, and then thermal throttled due to it running in excess of 115 degrees. So at least when I got it, it would double up as an oven. Since then, things are a little bit better, but still pretty dire. Now, it does come complete with a few loose keys and one missing key. I have no idea where the screws for the screen have gone, and don't even get me started on how it is to work on. I'm saving that for later on in this video. These HP pavilions were one of the most common use cases for AMD's clever dual graphics setup. But what is that, I hear you ask? Well, in theory, it was actually quite clever. To sum it up very briefly, back when AMD was releasing a lot of the frankly now redundant FM2 APUs probably around five to ten years ago, the idea was that when you buy these APUs, you would get a certain compatible Radeon graphics card, and they would run in Crossfire together, so you had the APU graphics and your dedicated graphics card. Sounds great. And for some use cases, it genuinely was. But now ask yourself this in 2021, and actually pretty much anything post-2016 probably, how well supported is AMD's Crossfire? Not very well. And how much support did those APUs actually get? Well, they weren't exactly very well supported either. Now, what happens when their biggest use case was in laptops that have the build quality and design that makes drawings from a child look more competent? Well, then you end up with these HP pavilions. What am I actually trying to say, though? Well, in theory, the idea behind these once common laptops is actually relatively sound. Given that AMD had a rather limited choice of CPUs that were worth using at the time, it comes along to HP, who have managed to bugger it up even more. See, these are rather toasted little units, and from what I can find online, people were having temperature issues with them just three years after buying one of these laptops. See, the cooling system on them, well, it's not actually too bad. I've stripped this entire laptop apart. So, what's happening? Well, two words. Thermal paste. So, just change it, right? Well, no. This generation of HPs doesn't require you to spend five minutes unscrewing a few bits just to change the thermal paste. You have to take the entire unit apart. That's right, keyboard up, motherboard flipped over, where you'll be greeted to a minuscule amount of dried up thermal paste. I wish when I did film all of this, frankly I did it a good few weeks ago when I didn't think I'd really be using this laptop much, well, it was an absolute state. And really, I don't want to risk breaking it by taking it apart again, because you have to take a lot apart just to get to the processor. Let's recap this then. Given the meager amount of thermal paste, flimsy build quality, frankly Apple tier servicing ease, AMD's lack of any real dual GPU support, or even any real quality driver updates, it's a combination that went from being a best-selling laptop from the era, to one that even a guy that built a PC for 25p is telling you to avoid. Still, I will actually give this laptop some credit. Underneath all of this is a quirky, sleek, and genuinely very functional laptop. The AMD A10 and APU are decently powerful. It's just a shame that it's undercut by AMD's even lowest tier Ryzen offerings. That's just how bad AMD was back then, that their highest end A10 chips, well, they've got nothing on the lowest end Ryzen chips. It's just this laptop is so over-engineered inside, yet all the internals are just, like, they're almost good. They are almost good, but they are housed in such a cheap quality laptop. The keyboard flexes, the plastic scuffs easily, the charging port somehow even manages to push the charger out sometimes. 
The screen looks nice at least, but how actually is it to use? Because I've been doing a lot of complaining at this point. Well, I've put on a fresh copy of Windows 10 21H1, I think, which is the latest version to date, which is installed to an SSD, which does help majorly. Actually, multitasking and using the laptop works phenomenally, most let down by the horrendous keyboard as I'm sat here typing this in a McDonald's. The CPU handles plenty of programs being left open, and as I type this, Discord is installing, the Wi-Fi range is good, and even the battery life is good given it's still the original battery. It is just so close to being decent, but it's superseded by so many better and cheaper offerings. It feels like a dinosaur compared to even older Core 2 Duo laptops I've used. However, its main selling point was always the Radeon Dual Graphics, because all the money's gone onto those internals, and it seems like no money at all has gone into the, um, frankly, cheap and awful and nasty actual laptop. So how well is this thing holding up in the benchmarks? Starting us off with CSGO, which actually ran surprisingly well. Considering a lot of older hardware I've actually gone back to test usually finds itself struggling to hit playable frame rates. In real world competitive matches, it can even hit over 60 FPS still. But given that also requires you to be the last man standing for that to even happen, it was never really likely, especially when you try and play with a trackpad. But still, for simpler and smaller game matches, it was off to a good start. Fable Lost Chapters, a classic title, did try to see him and use the dual graphics quite well, with both cards seeing a degree of utilization. Higher settings, decent frame rates, and a native resolution, which is mostly what I've tried to target unless I've specifically mentioned I haven't, is actually surprisingly doable on the laptop. There weren't even any real frame time issues, but that's possibly down to the CPU being a massive bottleneck. Either way, it was smooth enough that that didn't really matter. Now this one surprised me. Skyrim, at predominantly lower settings with a native resolution, actually ran even better than the last generation of consoles. If you forget what the PS3 version ran like, close to the Xbox 360 in terms of looks, but actually twice the frame rate. The CPU did seem to be taking quite the hammering though, and the dual graphics never really got an opportunity to stretch their legs here, which is a shame because this is one of the games that actually supported it really well. In combat and towns and cities, you would see the frame rate drop, but it was all still playable, so for Skyrim on the go, actually not too bad. Then finally I decided to give Civ 6 a quick test, as it can hammer any CPU, has really good dual GPU support, and I'm surprised it even supported this considering the drivers don't, um, but even then, the early game ran really well, smaller matches also ran really well through to the late game, larger games of course and busy, busy late games did not run well by any chance, but by this point I had already realised plenty of classic titles ran well, and end up binging a load of RimWorld instead of doing more Civ 6 benchmarking. This doesn't of course change the benchmarks from last time I looked at this laptop, where even titles like GTA 5 will run okay within reason. It all comes down to what the CPU can manage, and what the dual graphics drivers feel like doing. So you've got about a 50-50 chance in a best case scenario that things actually run properly and the way you want them to. Other than that, they just won't run well at all. It's a shame the CPU can't manage much past 2013, and the drivers stop supporting pretty much anything two years after that, as it's all really a bit of a mess, because if the graphics can handle it, the CPU can't, and if the CPU can handle it, well, chances are the drivers don't support it, so you are very limited with what will actually run on this hardware. Still, to round us off, I did run 3D Mark, the peak of utilization pretty much, and it just repeated this exact same information. That even is the best case scenario that the little A10 ends up being almost as much of an issue as the graphics card. But there was no presence of throttling, at least, in terms of actual, you know, the hardware and cooling, although the laptop did top out about 112 degrees, which is toasty, but that's about standard for a lot of modern laptops with dedicated graphics. Not so much the new Ryzen APUs, they seem to stay relatively cool, but on most new things with dedicated graphics, it still gets this hot. Still, in conclusion, there are some redeeming factors to this elaborate setup. Day-to-day -day tasks are incredibly snappy on the machine, and power usage remains incredibly low thanks to that APU setup. Media playback works really well, as long as there's no modern media decoding to be done, H.265 is out of the question. However, as someone that has had to painfully recreate all their assets on this machine, and essentially make an entire video on the laptop using this laptop, 
Well, it was rough. I had to convert all my files to WMV to allow HD video editing, otherwise this video was going to be in 480p, which in itself took two different conversion processes to actually work, otherwise for some reason the hardware would crash out as it didn't like me converting, I think it was MOV to MP4 to, and then MP4 to WMV. This is how confusing it gets, because the hardware was very strange with certain programs. And I have no idea what I'm going to call this, but I hope you enjoyed AMD and HP's horrible collaboration, the horrible HP. I have no idea. I hope you all enjoyed this mess of a laptop, and good night. So, this video was, as I said, all edited on something with more than likely less power than a modern phone. So, if you liked this, hopefully I don't have to make any more using this laptop, please do like and subscribe for more.